Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Julia, and it's my pleasure to be chairing uh, this session today, since I was a previous student of the UPF, so it's great to be back. And it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker of this plenary lecture, Professor Jordi Garcia Ojalvo. Uh, Jordi Garcia Ojalvo is a full professor at the Universita Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, and he's the head of the Laboratory of Dynamical Systems Biology. And today he will give a talk titled The Role of Dynamic Processes in Living Systems. So I will leave you the screen and I believe we have one hour of lecture and then we will have time for question and discussion. Screen is yours. Oops. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Julia, for the presentation. Let's see if I can make this thing happen. Okay, uh, I hope you can uh, see my, my screen. One second, let me just, okay. Yes. Um, so. Okay. So thank you so much, Julia. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like, well, good morning, everyone, or rather good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jerome and the rest of the organizers for the invitation. As a, a member of UPF, I have been following, of course, uh, the BPH school over the years, and I'm happy to be part of it uh, this year. So thank you so much. And also congratulations on this nice initiative. Uh, uh, so having said this, uh, let me start with, the, with, the, with my talk. I would. I have to say that uh, probably uh, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different from the rest of most of the talks in this week. Uh, what we are hearing is a, a, a very nice work uh, about the, um, the functioning uh, and the ways it cannot function properly of a fully formed human bodies. Uh, in particular, for instance, with um, the skeletal system or the cardiovascular system and what are the diseases associated with the malfunction of these systems. And we have also seen, we are also seeing that you can do very nice sophisticated modeling and data analysis to understand the functioning of this, uh, of this, uh, of this living system. Uh, and this, is, this, this would correspond to mostly operations within this, uh, within this, within this scale, even though we, are, we have just heard about also what happens at the cellular level. But the, in my case, I'm going to go to the opposite uh, limit, which is the limit of molecules and genes. Uh, and how do, how do we bridge this kind of the behavior of molecules and genes to the behavior of organisms as a whole, in particular, in particular in humans, of course. And my claim, I would like to claim that there are mm, uh, many different things that uh, basal, basic questions that we, we don't know yet. Uh, we don't know the answers yet. Uh, and I would like to raise a few examples. Uh, let me just begin with just very simple, uh, a very simple instance of what, I'm, what I wanted, what, what I mean by this, okay? For instance, we all know that the human bodies, for instance, human faces uh, are, are very, can be very variable, right? You can, we can have all kinds of morphologies uh, with people with different hair colors, with different shapes of the faces, but at the same time, we are also very robust. If you think about it, we are very robust because the, the, the face or all our body, in fact, share uh, very strong morphological similarities. Number of eyes, the, the nose, the, ma the mouth, where our arms are, uh, are located, which is very simple, right? But this means something very profound. This means that there are sources of variability. There, are, there is variability in, the, in, the, in, an, in an organism, such as the human body, that is allowed, and some variability that is not allowed. So then the question is, what is the variability that is allowed and the variability that is not allowed? And also, what are the limits of this allowed variability? For instance, here you can see uh, an example of the tallest and the shortest uh, NBA players uh, at the end of the 1980s, okay? And as you can see, here we have a difference in a scale of almost twofold. And yet, the bodies are more or less reasonably proportioned to each other, okay? Irrespective of the fact that we have a huge difference in size. Of course, we all know that we cannot have a difference of tenfold, okay? So what, what is the limit and why? First of all, why do we have this scalability? And what are the limits of this scalability? And how this depends on genes and, and the proteins and the, molec and the molecules that they determine our, the behavior, the final behavior of our, of our organism. And as you can imagine, of course, in order to answer this question, we have to uh, look at how do we get here, no? And we, we got here through development. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking a little bit about developing organisms. Uh, this is a developing human. Uh, and the question is, maybe we could start trying to uh, uh, investigate the, the answers to, to, the, to the questions that I just posed. 
by looking at these stages in our life, which are dynamical stages. Of course, the problem of working with human embryos are uh, evident because of uh, ethical issues. So I am going to uh, talk at the, in the first part of this talk, I'm going to move from the human to the mouse. And of course, there is a very clear um, correspondence between the two, uh, the two types of organisms. So I'm going to focus right now on mouse development as a model for human development and trying to address the questions that I was just raising earlier and how do molecularly uh, the scalability and the robustness of these uh, of these organisms uh, is controlled. Okay, because as I was saying, I mean, if there are problems in the development of an embryo, in many cases we just don't we just don't see it because the embryo is not viable anymore, and of course this impacts a lot uh, fertility. You no, know? so many of the fertility city, uh, problems that one might arise that the that might arise clinical are clinically are due to problems in the control of this scalability. Okay. So let's take a look at the at the at the embryo, uh, embryonic development in, development in mouse, and in particular, I'm going to try to address these questions at the, the simplest level possible. Okay, so I'm going to be thinking in terms of this timeline. So here you can see from the very first cell, the zygote, once it's fertilized, to what happens after uh, 4.5 days, which is embryonic day 4.5. Okay, in mouse. And I'm going to be focusing on this particular stage, which is a stage uh, which we call the blastocyst stage, in which the embryo has from 30 to 150 cells. So this is a time which we can um, study reasonably well, as you will see in a minute. And it has, uh, um, it is important in the in the in our uh, way in our goal of answering the questions that I was just posing. Okay. In particular, why is this uh, phase important? We're starting at 30 cells more or less in the embryo. This is important because uh, at this stage, this is when we uh, do our first decisions. I would like to say usually that we are, we like, we, we all are very proud of our free will and our ability to be different from each other. But all of us, the first two decisions that we ever made starting from a fertilized cell we all made the first, the same two decisions, okay? The first decision was becoming from a zygote, from a single cell, either two types of cells, inner cell mass or trophoectoderm, the inner cell mass are those that are the ones that are depicted in purple here, or the trophoectoderm cells, which are the ones depicted in green. And this is very important because trophoectoderm is basically the placenta and inner cell mass is the rest of the embryo. So this is the first decision that we all, all of us are sharing. This is the first decision that we all did. And the second one, the first decision that we made was from inner cell mass to primitive endoderm of epiblast, okay? So, and this is the one I'm, I'm be focusing on. So here epiblast is the embryo itself and the primitive endoderm is the yolk sac. Okay, so it's very important to know whether this decision is made properly. And if the decision is not made properly, the embryo is not going to be viable. So my question is what are the limits in which this, the, the decision this decision is made, okay? In terms of the, the sizes of the different uh, cellular populations that go into one phase or in the other phase. Okay, so we are going to address this looking at the experimental data. And I would like to show to you uh, the type of data that we are going to be discussing, okay? So this data was taken by Nestor Seid, who was a postdoc at the lab of Kat Hadjantonakis at the Sloan Kettering uh, Institute in New York City. And this is the type of data that you have. So basically here you have embryos and these are uh, stained uh, with immunofluorescent proteins. And in that way, we can distinguish between the two fates. Let me remind you. And I'm not going to go into the details about the biology. You just have to keep in mind that we have a blue fate and a, and a red fate, and a red fate. okay? Cells in, in our early versions of our cells, they have to decide to either become red or become blue, okay? And uh, this, here you can see the cells, the, the red cells and the blue cells and the trophoectoderm cells. So you, we can count them. We can count them for embryos of different sizes. And this is a summary of the data that we can get. Okay, so here you can see embryos which have been sorted out by size. It's not that we have one per embryo number. This is just uh, the first, the smaller embryo that we are looking at, 32 cells or 216 cells. And here you see what is the percentage of cells from this inner cell mass the ones that are not green, that either are uh, inner cell mass themselves or red or blue. So you can see here the distribution. And this is a bit variable. That's what I was telling you about. I mean, there's a lot of variability, which makes it even more surprising that eventually the, the body plan is so, is so reproducible. That's part of the question that we are addressing here. But you can see that there is, in spite of the, uh, there being a large variability, it is clear that at the beginning, you have a lot of undifferentiated purple cells and eventually, there is a nice split between red and blue cells. Here you can see it quantified. 
Uh, we are grouping here embryos with, uh, with a, uh, from 32 to 64 cells, so somewhere around here, uh, 60, 64 to 90, et cetera. And this is the percentage of cells in each one of the phase. And you can see that as time goes on, as the embryo develops, we get to a very nice, almost 50-50 split. These gray cells here are basically red. It's just a matter of how we label them, okay? So you, whenever you see a gray, a gray color here, you can, you can think of it as red because it's the same fate, okay? These are cells that just, that just lost their red marker, but eventually these are red. And you can see that there is a very nice, almost 50-50 split. And then the question is, okay, what controls this split? So you have to think uh, that this very small embryo at the very early stages, you have cells that are purple, that are undifferentiated, and they have to decide to become one state or the other, okay? So now, what is the circuitry? What is the molecular uh, mechanism that underlies this choice, the self-paid choice from purple to red or, or to red or to blue? Unfortunately, well, there is a lot of knowledge already in biology of what, about this type of the, the type of genetic circuits, if you will, that are underlying this decision. For instance, this is uh, known for 15 years already. This is a, this is the case of the sulfate decision in the hematopoietic uh, system. So, if you start with the hematopoietic stem cells, they have to make a decision from uh, uh, to become either erythroids or myeloids, for instance, these are two phase. And it is quite well known that this is driven by circuits like this. You have two proteins that inhibit each other's uh, activity. So this protein here, GATA1, inhibits PU1 and vice versa, and they can even be self-activating. This type of uh, genetic circuits immediately are going to give rise to situations in which you have two possible states that we represent here by these black circles. So since these are two different fates, and this could correspond to the red fate or to the blue fate in our case. And what this means that what the cell has to do is they have to make a choice, which is in principle, one could think that it's a more or less random choice to go either to the B fate or to the A fate. And in that way, you could have this split, this cell fate decision happening between these two, the, these two states, okay? Now, is this happening also in our case? We are talking here about adult stem cells, pluripotent, Hemat sorry, hematopoietic stem cells of the blood system, okay? What about our, our very pluripotent cells, okay? In, inside the embryo in this second cell to fade decision. Well, it is known that in the same way that we have this kind of circuitry with two proteins inhibiting each other and activating themselves, we also have identified, the people have identified two, if you will, regulators of these two fates, which are called Nanoc and GATA6. When they are active, this means that the cell takes one, one fate or the other. And um, people have seen indirectly that there is this kind of interaction between these proteins. Now, if this is the case, if this is the circuit that determines this kind of cell fate decision, this is something that is cell autonomous in, in the sense that these two genes and these two proteins are, here, are, is, are, are locked inside a cell. And then, uh, the, in principle, the idea is that the cell is making a random choice to either go to A or to go to B. Imagine that the cells are somewhere in here, then they are going to be either going to A or to B. And this is going to be more or less random. Okay, so cells are flipping a, a coin to decide whether to become red or to become blue. The question is, is, is whether this is what really happens. So the question is whether the, the decision between epiblast and primitive endoderm is cell autonomous or not. So what I'm going to do now in order to address this question is I'm going to show you one particular experiment. And I'm aware that we haven't had any break, so, uh, uh, I don't want to be, uh, I want to be as clear as possible and I don't want to get into too many details at the same time, okay? If you have any question, another thing that you can do is feel free to interrupt me during the, class, during the, 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 the talk because at the end of the day, this is called a school. So please feel free to interrupt me, okay? So now I'm going to try to decide whether this decision is still autonomous or not. And for that, let's, uh, I'm going to show you, show you an experiment that Nestor did, okay? And the experiment is the following. This looks very crowded, but uh, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to understand if I explain it properly, okay? The idea is the following. Imagine, first of all, we have normal, normal mice, what we call wild type mice, okay? And the only thing that we do is we are crossing them with mice that have this, uh, this fluorescent tag in such a way that all the cells coming from these normal mice are going to be uh, tagged in green. They're going to be producing this green, green, green fluorescent protein, so we are going to see them in green, okay? That's normal cells. And then what we're going to do is we're going to also create some mice that the, 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 what these mice have is that they are, they are uh, mutants. They cannot produce the GATA, the GATA6 pro, uh, protein, okay? So let me remind you here, this protein here, we are going to create mice that cannot produce it. So if these mice cannot produce this protein, this means that they cannot go, they can only go to the red fate. 
And that's why we are plotting them in this um, kind of magenta color. It's similar to red because all the cells are going to be red. They cannot be blue because they don't have GATA6, okay? So these are lineage constrained cells. So now we take these two mice, we take these two early embryos, we disaggregate them, and then we mix them together. So what we can do is we can take cells from one type or for the other type, and then we mix them together. And we can mix them in different fractions. So we can, for instance, consider a situation in which we have only cells coming from the mutant mice that cannot produce the blue fate. So this means that all the cells are going to be red, or we can increase more and more the, norm, the number of normal cells, which let me remind you again, these normal cells, the green, can either become blue or red because they have the, the, the possibility to choose. Okay, the green cells can choose, the red cells cannot choose, this the purple, this sorry, these magenta cells cannot choose. They are forced to be red, okay? Let me remind you what happens in a normal wild type mouse, something like this, okay? So as the time goes on, basically what happens is that they make this 50-50 choice. So now what I'm going to show you is what happens with these different chimeric embryos, these embryos that have the combination of the two cells, and again, the red cells cannot choose, only the green cells can choose, and then we can track what they have chosen because they, we have marked them, okay? So let me show you this data. So here we have, this is going to be the cells coming from the normal wild type mouse, okay? Which are all marked in green. And these are the cells coming from this mouse, which are cells that cannot become blue, okay? So that is why they are all green. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. They are all red. They are all red because they cannot become blue. They, they are forced to be in this red fate. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start uh, changing the proportion. So this is the limit in which all the cells that uh, of this uh, embryo are basically, almost all of them are basically, sorry, are, almost all of them are basically green. Here you can see, this is the proportion of final green cells. So when we are here, this means that most of the cells that we have in the aggregate are green. So they are free to choose. And as you can see, they are free to choose and they choose almost 50-50. But you can already see that this is not exactly 50-50. This is slightly less than 50-50. And you, you might be thinking already, oh, this is the case because since I am already adding some red cells that are forced to be red, these cells know that they don't have to become red and most of them become blue, okay? So what happens, let's see if that is the case. Let's see what happens if we introduce more and more red cells in our assays. So now I'm gonna show you here what happens if I have aggregates of cells in which more and more of these cells are restricted to become red, which are here. And this is what happens. So first, if you want, let's take a look at this plot. Of course, this is trivial. All of these cells, because they come from the red mouse, they are all becoming red. They cannot choose. They are forced to become red. But interestingly, what happens is that the other cells, the cells that can choose whatever they want, they don't choose anymore 50-50. And you might ask why? Of course, they don't choose 50-50 because there are already red cells in the aggregate. So if this is not a 50-50 choice, I hope you agree with me that this is because these cells know that there are cells, red cells in the, in the aggregate. And this, these cells know that they don't, not all of them or not 50% of them need to become red because there are already red cells in the aggregate. So this means that these cells know that, uh, that there are neighbors that they, they have other fates. So this means that, this, that the cell decision is, that is not cell autonomous. Because if it was cell autonomous, I hope you agree with me, that this was, these cells would always be 50-50. They wouldn't care. They wouldn't care at all because th that there are, there are other cells that are lineage restricted in the red fate, okay? So I hope this is, a, this is clear. So this means that the decision is not cell autonomous. So now the question is, well, how do we uh, transform this into a, a non-cell autonomous system? Because as I was saying, these two proteins are embedded inside the cell and they cannot communicate, cells cannot communicate. They just, they just choose their fate out cell autonomously. So there is something clearly missing in this picture. So what is missing? So anyway, a lot is known about this system uh, over the years and it is known that there are other players. And other, another player that is known to be important is this growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, FGF. This growth factor is produced by the red cells and this growth factor is uh, able to go out of the cell and go into the neighbors and then come back and, and help inform the choice, okay? So this means that cells communicate via this molecule. This is a signaling molecule, okay? So now the question is whether this FGF signal is necessary for the decision to, play, to take place or not. So let me go back uh, to, the, to the experiments again. And one thing that we can do is we can knock out, we can use the, we can again build mice which cannot produce this factor 
or which cannot produce this receptor. These things here are receptor molecules that sense this growth factor, okay? So what happens if we knock out, if we eliminate the ability of the mouse to, or to produce this FGF factor or the ability of the mouse to sense this FGF factor? This is again the wild type, 50-50 as always. And this is what happens when you have these mutants for FGF and for the receptors. And I would like you to focus on these two bars which correspond to the full mutant. So this means my, the, the two alleles are, have been eliminated. So this means that these mice can produce no FGF at all, no signal. And these mice can produce no receptors at all. So they cannot sense the signal, even though the signal is there. And as you can see is that in the full absence of the signal or in the full absence of the, of the receptor, the cells cannot make the decision. So all the cells go into the red state, okay? So this means that FGF signaling is necessary I hope you agree with me, the FGF signal is necessary for the decision to, to take place, okay? So intercellular signaling, signaling cell to cell is necessary for the decision. But now let me ask the following, is it sufficient? Or is it something that it's there and if it, uh, and, uh, 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 so maybe uh, it is not, so, is, it, is it not sufficient? Do we need something else, okay? So in order to address this question, now let's, let's uh, move to modeling, okay? So at the end of the day, as I was uh, telling you, you are seeing a lot of uh, very sophisticated models, and there are models which are more or less sophisticated for this type of question. For instance, this model was, was uh, published a few years ago by the group of Genevieve Dupont, in which you have the whole circuit, you have a collection of differential equations here, and then you can take a look at, uh, at the decisions that the cell makes in the presence of all these interactions. But of course, the problem is that with such a complicated circuit, it's very hard, it becomes very hard to, uh, to determine what is sufficient and what is necessary, okay? So I would, be, I, would, I would like to eliminate or to decouple the direct interaction between Nata, Nanok and Gata-6 and the interaction mediated by the signaling, okay? So that's what we're going to do next. We are going to try to simplify this model and co consider a model which only includes the cell-to-cell -cell signaling but does not include the, cells, the, cells are the, direct cells, the, the, direct, the direct interaction between the NOC and GATA-6. So that's what we're going to do. This is, the, this is the scheme. This is basically the same scheme as this one in a different way. Here we have the direct interaction between the NOC and GATA-6 and the interaction mediated by the signaling, okay, by the extracellular signaling. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to transform this model into this model here. Okay, so we are going to eliminate, first of all, this, uh, this uh, uh, auto activation, we are going to eliminate the direct uh, mutual inhibition because there is no, there is no uh, clear evidence, direct evidence, experimental evidence that these uh, interactions exist. So let's eliminate them and let's go to only the part which is driven by FGF signaling, which is activating this ELK molecule, which uh, is also very common in many other signaling problems uh, uh, in mammalian cells, okay? So let's focus on this model now, which is much simpler than this. And this is, in, in, and in this model, the interaction between the and GATA-6 is mediated only by this extracellular signal, okay? So now, to be honest, if you look at this model here, you can see that there is, this, there is here an activation, and here this is an inhibition. This arrow here corresponds to an inhibition. So you can see that GATA-6 is inhibiting the NOC in this case, and also there is an inhibition from NANOC to GATA-6. So this model already contains a mutual inhibition between GATA-6 and NANOC, but it is mediated by the cell-cell signaling molecule, okay? So this means that the decision has to be mediated by the communication between cells. And our hypothesis is that it is this communication that allows the cells to be able to, take, to, uh, to make a decision which is not cell autonomous and hopefully lead to the scaling behavior that I was discussing earlier, okay? okay? So anyway, this is the model that we are considering for this circuit, okay? And we have three differential equations, one for NANOG, one for GATA-6, and one for FGF. And uh, what, as you can see here, the effect of FGF of this signal on NANOG is mediated by the extracellular communication. So this means that the FGF here is an average of our neighbors, okay? Because now FGF, when it comes out of the cell, it's going to be distributed among all the different, all the different cells that are next to each other. So now this means that nanoc in this cell is going to be affected by FGF, not only in the, in, the, in, the, in the same cell, but in all the neighbors. That's why we have here an average of our neighbors, both regarding the effect of FGF in nanoc and the effect of FGF in, in GATA. Okay, so that's basically our model. Now let's make it even simpler. Let's make it even simpler. Uh, just try to see whether we can find some clear intuition of how this model behaves, because at least now that we are simplifying so much, hopefully we can gain some intuition of how, about how this model works, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this model 
and we are going to assume that two of the variables are in quasi-equilibrium. Okay, this is just an assumption. We don't need to make this assumption, but just for the sake of simplicity. So we are going to assume that data six very quickly goes to equilibrium and FGF as well. So this means that we can put these two equations equal to zero and we can obtain here the quasi steady state values of data six and FGF and put it here. And eventually, so this means that data comes from this equation, FGF comes from this equation and eventually have an equation only for NANOC. And that's what we get, okay? This is the equation that we get for NANOC. X now is a dimensionless version of NANOC. This, let me remind you again that NANOC is this protein that determines the red fate. So now I have only one equation for this protein per cell. So this index here represents an index for the different cells in the embryo, okay? So now I have one equation per cell and this equation contains the dynamics, uh, the behavior of NANOC as a function of in data six and FGF in an indirect manner through uh, this average here, this is the average of our neighbors, okay? Now, this is really a minimal model, as you can see, because it has, in fact, we, we have also made the model dimensionless, so now we have only two parameters, apart from these two coefficients, the two, these two exponents, M and M, N and M, we have only two parameters, the parameter alpha and the parameter K, which is basically, these are combinations of the different biochemical parameters that they determine the behavior of the system, okay? So now we have one equation per cell for our N cells in the embryo, and this equation is telling us how NANOG is going to respond. And I would like to point out uh, again that we have here that in NANOG is inhibited by the value of NANOG in the neighbors. Okay, so we can see here that this is where the neighbor, the, the value of NANOG in the neighbors comes in. It comes in the denominator, which means that if NANOG is high in one cell, it's going to force NANOG to be low in the, in the neighboring cells. Okay, so now. This, I'm not sure you, you were, if you are familiar with the, this type of uh, problems, this might remind you to what's called lateral inhibition. And this happens in other types of signaling systems in which, um, uh, for instance, signaling by delta, uh, signaling by delta inhibits the expression of delta in a neighboring cell, okay? This is called lateral inhibition and this leads to this type of fine grain patterns that are also very important. For, uh, for our tissue uh, organization in many, at, at, at many different levels, okay? So uh, this means that in some sense, the behavior of our system is similar to uh, lateral inhibition in the sense that when one cell becomes red, what we are saying here is that it forces the neighboring cells to become blue if possible, okay? And indeed, what we can do is we can take this, uh, this model here, which is a model for N cells, and we can just uh, assume that we have only two clusters, two types of cells. We have the red and the blue cells, which means that we have only two equations, equations for the red cells and equations for the blue cells. And in fact, we could assume, to, for, simplific for simplification purposes, we could assume that we have only two cells, if you will. Okay, if we had only two cells, then you would have one equation for cell A, one equation for cell B. And now we can analyze very easily the behavior of this model just by plotting the null clients of, this, uh, of these equations in the phase plane. This is the phase plane of the, of the values of NANOC in cells of type A or in cell, in cell A and in cell B. And the red and blue uh, lines here correspond to the, to the uh, null clients, which are the lines for, that make these equations equal to zero, okay? And the crossing points between these null clients are fixed points of these systems. And you can see that there are two different fixed points. Either the system can be in a way in which cell A is high in NANOC and cell B is low in NANOC, or this cell, Cell B would be, this would be the opposite situation in which cell B is high in NANOC and cell A is uh, low in NANOC. So these are symmetric fates. As you can see, as you can imagine, this is basically the same fate because this is a symmetric uh, commutation. One cell is high in NANOC and the other cell is low, okay, or vice versa. Now, this could be two cells, but it could also be two populations, as I was saying earlier, okay? We can imagine that we have red cells and white uh, and blue cells. They are mixed together and each one of the cells is obeying each one of these two equations. And this means that we have these two states, which are attractors of the dynamics whenever we, whenever we start. If we start in a more or less symmetric situation, which is where the embryos are starting, as we let the time go on, the cells are going to be either to the red fate or to the blue fate, okay? That's a, so, and that's the idea. So this model is telling us that there's going to be an attractor and it's, more, it's quite symmetric because you can see here that phase space is distributed in a more or less symmetric manner. Half of the cells are going to go, more or less half of the cells are going to go to the red state and half of the cells are going to go to the blue state, okay? And this is indeed what we see experimentally. This is what you have seen already. As time goes on, 
the cells are attracted to one of the two fates. And we can understand from a very simple model that this is happening due to this inhibition of nano over neighboring cells, okay? These are, uh, these are other representations of the attraction behavior in different kinds of studies in our paper, in an earlier paper, on other papers by other groups. And you can see that the, that the system starts, the embryo starts with a wide ratio between primitive endoderm and epi cells, and eventually it tends to one, okay? So this is really an attractor that we can see experimentally. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is very simplistic. This model is too simple. Is it really working? If I, if I try to model a real embryo in which cells are proliferating and moving, are they going to go to these two different states according to this model? And to do that, what we can do is we can model the different cells using a very simple agent-based approach in which we consider simple mechanics, uh, interact, simple mechanical interactions between neighboring cells, and we let the cells proliferate, and we let, this, we let them decide the, the, the fate on the basis of the, of the FGF that they sense from their neighbors, okay? So this is a real experimental situation, and this is the way that we model this thing. Every one of the cells has a position. Now X, I apologize for the X here, means the position of the cells, and the position is obeying Newton's law, basically, with some friction, okay? And this is the force that we assume, taking into account that there are some uh, attractive forces that keep the cells uh, relatively close to each other. This is a typical uh, simulation that we get when we put the, the dynamical model in each one of the cells. At the beginning, everything is purple and eventually they, they make decisions either they become red or blue. We also include some differential addition. I'm not going to enter into this that uh, allows for self-segregation of the cells in the two fates, mimicking what we see experimentally. And we can plot what is the fraction of red cells and blue cells as time goes on in our simulations. And this is what we get. So in our very simple model, let me remind you, only one equation per cell corresponds to, to the non-dynamics. What we see is that at the beginning, all the cells are in this, uh, in this uh, undifferentiated state, purple, and eventually, oops, sorry, and eventually they move on to a, to a fate which is either blue or red, almost 50-50. Not exactly 50-50 because experimentally, we know that there are slightly more, a slightly larger number of primitive endoderm than epiblast cells. So this is the experimental results from different studies. And as you can see, we can mimic relatively nicely the, the dynamics that we see with, in, in a model that contains only cell-cell communication via FGF. There is no direct inter, in, in, intracellular interaction between ANOC and ANATA-6, okay? So this indicates that FGF is both necessary and sufficient for this decision, okay? Not only this, now I would like to address the problem of scaling I was telling you about a minute ago. So can we recapitulate the scaling? In fact, it is known, uh, in fact, Nestor and Kat a few, uh, four years ago already or five years ago, they had uh, published results in which they saw that indeed this experimental model, this experimental system had this uh, scaling properties in the sense that they could, if you take a single embryo, you can count the number of red and blue cells and you get 50-50. Now you can take the single embryo and split it into two and culture them. And again, you get 50-50. And the same thing if you take two embryos and merge them together, you're going to have a larger embryo, but again, the proportion of red and blue cells is still going to, is still going to be 50-50. Here's the data, okay? This is the data that they obtain. This is the control situation, more or less 50-50 in this, well, this is the single, case, and you can see the 50-50 here is still some undifferentiated cells, but again, the split is more or less half and half. And this is what happens in the half embryo. When you break the embryo apart at the H cell stage and culture it, you again get that each one of the embryos goes to this 50-50 stage. And when you double it, because you merge two different embryos together and you get that the, an embryo is double the size, you still have a 50-50 split. Okay, so this indicates that these kind of systems have this type of scaling properties. And the question is whether our simple, very simple minimal model reproduces this scaling. And indeed this is the case, okay? We can take an embryo, we can split it in half, we can let it run in the simulations. And we see that indeed we get uh, an, uh, uh, a split that is more or less the same as the wild type. And the same thing is we, if, if we double the, uh, the embryo size, okay? So this means that first of all, our simple model in which FGF signaling is the only thing that there is, there is not, nothing else. It reproduces the, the self-aid decision, not only in the wild type situation, but without changing parameters, I have to say, okay? Because that's the key, we are not changing parameters in our model, we are reproducing what the, the, the result of a half embryo or a double embryo, okay? But now the question is really how robust this attractor is, because you might be thinking, oh, uh, well, we cannot go farther. We cannot go farther in the in the experiments. Uh, so that's why we didn't go farther than two x or half x. 
because that's the limit that they had experimentally. But then the question is, can we test the robustness of this decision in a more controlled manner? And this is the second set of, uh, of experiments that I would like to show to you right now, okay? The first type of perturbation that we did to the embryo that we did both in the model and the experiments is expanding what we call the expanding the epiblast pool, okay? What it means now is that we can, in a targeted manner, add cells in the embryo. We can add cells that are restricted to be red, are going to be red, at any point, at some point in the future, okay? So this is different from the first experiment that I was telling you because this means we have an already formed embryo and after 2.5 days, now we are going to add some cells and these cells that you can see here in yellow, these cells are embryonic stem cells. And these embryonic stem cells, they are known that they are going to become red, okay? Embryonic stem cells are epiblast. So after a while, they are going to become red, okay? So we are adding now a certain amount not too much, just a few, a small, this is a small perturbation. We are going to add cells that are going to be red cells after a while, okay? They are already, they are smaller because that's the way it is. They are smaller cells, but eventually if you culture them and then we measure what is the outcome in the, in the, in the embryo. First, let me show you a modeling results, okay? So here you can see a modeling, a modeling, a mod, uh, an in silico experiment, if you will, in which we add yellow cells. This is embryonic stem cells, which are restricted to become red. And as you can see, eventually the system, uh, you have some cells becoming red. Most of the cells become blue, as you will see in a minute, depending on how many you choose, because let me remind you, these yellow cells are basically red in all respects, okay? So what happens, uh, so well, by the way, in a, of course, in our model, we can follow, this would be time traces from our, from our model in which we follow individual cells. Uh, sorry, these are not individual cells, these are individual embryos. And you can see here an individual embryo. This is the percentage of ICM cells that are, undifferentiated and eventually you have the differentiation event and they eventually you end up having the fade distribution that I was telling you earlier. Now we have less red cells because we have some yellow cells here, okay? So this is what we can do. We can, we can do statistics of this to see what the model is telling us. And this is what the model is telling us. This is what happens depending on where, how many green cells we are adding. So, when, when, so this means that we have added here a lot of green cells, a lot of embryonic stem cells. And you can see that if we add a lot of embryonic stem cells, the, the, the embryo cannot recover the 50-50 split, okay? Because, I mean, they, they, the, the embryo is overrun, okay? You have too many of these green cells, which are going to become red. As you can see, not many of the, nat of the native cells from the embryo are becoming red because the embryo doesn't need it. But still, the, the cells from the, from the mouse are completely overrun by the stem cell. Okay, but I would like to focus on this situation, which is the one that I'm interested in, because here you can see that I add just a fit, a little bit of uh, embryonic stem cells, which are going to become red. And again, as I was telling you, the, the cells of the mouse decide not to become 50-50 uh, blue and red, but there is only, uh, so you can see that there is this, this balance in which you have uh, cells becoming red in only enough cells to have 50-50 split, more or less, okay? So you have a region in which the system is more or less robust. I keep adding more and more embryonic stem cells, which are going to become red. And then you have less and less cells that become, decide to become red because you already have cells that are going to become red. This is similar to the experiment that I was telling you. But here, the thing is that we are adding from zero to 60 additional cells after 48 hours, and the system is very robust. Okay, so we have a, a substantial robustness. We are proving the limits. At the end of the day, of course, the system is going to be overrun. You're going to have too many of these epiglass cells. These embryos are not going to be viable. When it, well, this is, of course, this is still the model. Let me show you now what the experiments tell us. And this is what the experiments tell us, okay? This looks a bit different because in this particular case, this is, these are wild type embryos that we put here together, but we, you should compare this with this. Here we start adding blue, uh, green cells. And you can see we keep adding and adding and adding, and then we have less and less cells becoming red and red and red. And eventually, of course, the system gets overrun, but there is a huge window in which we keep adding embryonic stem cells and the system robustly decides to stay in this 50-50 split just because at the end, there is no need for the cells to become red. All of the cells from the mouse are becoming blue because it has enough cells that are going to become red, which are the green cells, okay? So that's the first perturbation, and we can see that the system is really robust to us perturbing the, uh, the embryo at this very early stage, in, uh, at the very early stage by adding these cells. Now, let me show you the second perturbation. The second perturbation is we go to the opposite limit. Let's go to remove in a targeted manner of cells. So one thing that we can do experimentally that Nestor could do experimentally, 
was to remove cells in a targeted manner by using laser ablation, okay? So basically you have this uh, mouse, that is the, the mouse embryo that is being growing. If you label the cells in such a way that you know which ones are the cells that are going to be, for instance, a, a primitive endonym here, here, sorry for the color change, but these cells that are here in green are the ones that are marked by a primitive endonym specific nuclear marker. So these cells here, these were the ones that we were labeling, that I was showing earlier in blue. Here I am showing them in green. I'm sorry for the color change. But this means that you know which ones are in one phase or which ones are in the other. And now this means that you can use a laser to target, to kill in a targeted manner specific cells or one phase or another. Okay, so that's what you do. And in that way, we see what happens when you start eliminating cells. Let me show you first what the model predicts. What the model shows, and sorry for this is a very this is a very uh, complicated uh, um, slide. I'm sorry for that. So this is basically the model behavior for a single embryo. We can forget about this first uh, uh, this first row here. Let's take a look at the second row. Okay, and this is what happens when we target randomly. We eliminate randomly. 30% of cells from the from the purple state, okay, which the undifferentiated cells. So I, I eliminate 30% of the undifferentiated cells randomly. And what we see is that this, this, the, the embryo doesn't care, okay? I, I, I have killed 30% of the cells, but since I am eliminating undifferentiated cells, okay, then the embryo is, the, the, the remaining differentiate, undifferentiated cells are, I mean, are still going to be making the right choice. And that is why you still have a very nice, uh, self aid choice, which is more or less 50-50. What happens if you eliminate in a targeted manner cells that either are, are blue or red, okay? And this is very extreme. I imagine that at a certain point, uh, this, I, I can also choose when I am eliminating these things, okay? So imagine that at a certain point, I choose to eliminate all the blue cells. I just randomly, uh, sorry, not randomly, I kill, I ablate with, the, with, my, with our laser beam, all the cells that are uh, that are in the blue phase. Okay, so what we can see that if we are not doing it too late, so in this area here, even if we eliminate 100%, the system can still recover. Why? Because there are still undifferentiated cells that come to the rescue and become blue. blue. So that is why the system is robust. Of course, eventually it's too late. Okay, if we kill the cells too late, there are no more progenitor cells left and the, and the embryo cannot recover. And the same thing for the red cells. It's the same idea. At the beginning, if I have, if the, the embryo still has enough proliferating cells, uh, undifferentiated cells, sorry, you are going to recover the red population, but eventually we are eliminating so many red cells so late that the system doesn't have time to recover. We have no more undifferentiated cells to, to reproduce the, the fate, and eventually um, the system, the, the embryo will, not, will be not viable because we don't have the 50-50 split, okay? This is the experiment, the, the numerical prediction. Let me show you now. Uh, the experimental results, okay? And again, this is a very complicated picture in which we tested many different, uh, many different uh, perturbations. Let me focus on only two, okay? The rest we can take a look later if you are interested. This is what happens when we, when we eliminate 100% of the blue cells or 100% of the epi cells at, the, at different stages, okay? This is early and then later and later and later. And as you can see, if we eliminate all the blue cells early, the system is able to recover and we get more or less to the 50-50 split. If we eliminate too late, when, we, the cell, when the embryo is already at this stage, this means that now the blue cells cannot recover because we have eliminated all of them. So just a few of them uh, can arise from the undifferentiated cells, but the, the embryo cannot recover anymore. Okay, and the same thing with the epi cells. At the beginning, you still have a nice split, but eventually, the, the, we have eliminated too many red cells and the system cannot recover anymore, okay? So this is indicating that we have limits to, the, the embryo has limits to, our, to its ability to recover, okay? And we can, we can uh, quantify this in a very precise manner, okay? So that's the conclusion so far. What I wanted to, what, what I have been showing you so far is that, uh, first of all, FGF signaling, cell cell signaling via FGF is both necessary and sufficient for cell fate decision in the early embryo of the mouse. And we have seen this using a, a, math, a very simple minimal mathematical model. We have seen that the mechanism is analogous to lateral inhibition, for those of you who are uh, familiar with this. Uh, and we have also seen that the decision is robust to different types of tissue size perturbations, which can be global or local, okay? That's uh, the point number one. 
And now let me spend just a couple of, uh, a few more minutes if uh, I think I still have a bit more time. So in the, 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 I'm going to spend a few more minutes going back to uh, the distinction between um, mouse and human. So as Laura was also pointing out uh, in her talk yesterday, no? so, okay, we learned something from mice. How does this translate into humans? No? And I was kind of uh, referring to this, um, to the similarity between the two embryonic uh, development uh, proce processes in, the, in, in these two organisms. Uh, so now I would like to distinguish a little bit. Uh, I would like to address uh, one particular um, distinction between the two embryos, which is regarding time scales. Okay, so these are very similar uh, processes, but as you can imagine, here you can see that the uh, this is the size of the this is the size of the of the human embryo after week nine. Uh, uh, this is 60 days, but the mouse embryo reaches the same stage only after 20 days. Let me, and, and let me tell you that, of course, we are talking here about 60 days, so this is well before birth, okay? But in any case, this is the comparable embryo. Uh, this is already at the, at the birth time in mice. Of course, we know that the uh, mouse, uh, uh, mice have a birth much earlier than humans, and the, and the mouse pups are more or less uh, develop, more, more developed than humans are the times of birth. But even so, if we compare at the same stage of embryonic development, we still have a relatively large difference in time scale. So the question is, why, is my, why uh, are mice faster than humans uh, in development, for instance, three times? I mean, at the end of the day, if they are so similar, where is this time scale difference coming from? That's the question that I would like to address in the next few minutes. Um, and uh, the question is, what is the origin of, the, of this difference? Um, uh, given that the, there is so much similarity into this in, in these developmental processes, okay? So in order to address this question, I would like to, um, to refer to a specific uh, process in development, which is later in development than the one that we have been discussing, uh, which is very nice because this kind of periodicity in time is reflected into, it's, it's clearly seen uh, in the organism, and this is, the fact that both humans and mice, we share something which is a, a periodic spine. We share vertebrae, and we have this very strong periodicity in our spines. This is a characteristic of all vertebrates, of course. And this kind of a spatial periodicity, we know that it comes from a temporal periodicity. And this is where I would like to come in because now I'm talking about the differences in time scales between mice and humans. So let's look at some kind of time dependent event that we can measure. And let's consider that the that the if we can try, if we can find out what is the time dependent event that determines this spatial periodicity, maybe we can learn something about comparing the development at this stage uh, of humans and uh, of and mice. So, okay, what is the process that it translates this spatial uh, that makes this produces this spatial periodicity from a temporal periodicity? And this is also quite well known for, for the last two decades or so, or three decades. It's a so-called somatogenesis clock, okay? And the way this works is the following. We have a, a set of cells in the, in the posterior part of the embryo, which is so-called presomitic mesoderm. And these cells here oscillate in time. I'm gonna show you a movie. And you can see here, this is the expression of a particular protein that I will describe in a minute. And you can see that the, the, the expression of this protein is, uh, is uh, oscillating. Okay, this is, by the way, this is a mouse embryo. This is a, these are experiments by the group of Alexander Aulela. And you can see that there is a clock in this presomitic mesoderm, in this part of the embryo. And this produces waves, periodic waves, and these periodic waves propagate, and, when, and they freeze eventually, and this is what produces the segments. So these are the, you see here the spatial periodicity, and this spatial periodicity is produced from this temporal periodicity here. Okay, so now we have a clock here. And then the question is, how does this clock compare between humans and mice? First of all, let's say, before answering this question, can we understand where this comes, where this uh, clock comes from, from a molecular point of view? And the answer is yes, it is quite well known from the last, again, two or three decades, that this is due to, this clock is driven by a specific circuit, which is relatively simple. It's a protein, which is called HES7. And this protein, is basically repressing its own expression. So what we have here is a delayed negative feedback. And this delayed negative feedback is already very well known to underline the oscillations that I was showing you earlier, okay? So uh, this, is a, this will be a very simple delayed differential equation model. 
in which the mRNA, the expression of mRNA of this gene uh, has seven, is depending in a, in a negative manner on the protein itself with a certain delay, okay? And uh, so we have here a delay which is uh, uh, driven by the mRNA, and then you have here a delay which is, this is we, could, we would call this transcription delay, and then you have a translation delay, okay? So the protein is depending on the amount of mRNA at a time tau p earlier because uh, the dependence cannot be, I mean, it takes time for the transcription and translation to take place. So we have certain delays, which is simply the time that these processes take, and we can have different delays in this system. And by uh, playing with this type of model, we know uh, from previous literature already almost 20 years ago, that a model like this is going to produce sustained oscillations. And this is what's known and what's believed that's happening in the presomitic messenger, okay? So now this is very well known so far. It's uh, been known for us, I was telling you 20 years, but the question is, can we use this knowledge in, in order to try to compare the time scales of human and mice? Okay, uh, and I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be showing you this uh, quite uh, quickly because uh, my time is going to be over relatively soon. But let me show you. First of all, of course, the problem is that we can make these measurements in a mouse embryo, as I was just showing you a minute ago. We cannot do this type of movies in a in a human embryo for obvious reasons, for the ethical reasons. So what we can do is we can extract cells from the presomatic mesoderm or we can uh, extract cells from humans and transform them and make them pluripotent. And then we can turn them into, into cells uh, of this, uh, which are presomitic mesoderm cells, okay? And we, there are protocols that allow us to, from, starting from human cells, make them pluripotent and then transform, in, transform, in, transform them into these PSM cells. And this is the type of data that I'm going to show you. This is, uh, this is work that has been done in the lab of Miki Evisuya here at the Embol, Embol Barcelona at the PRBB. And what you can see here is in vitro, you have cells that come from mouse embryonic stem cells, and they have been transformed by using well-known protocols into PS PSM cells, cells from the presomitic mesoderm. This is what you have here in vitro. And we can do the same thing with humans, okay? So we take adult uh, cells from humans, we transform them in, into pluripotent cells, and then we uh, induce them to become PSM cells. And this, and you can hear, you can see here the two cultures, and we are going to compare the two clocks. First of all, if you look at any of the two, you see the cells oscillating, okay, in both cases. But I'm pretty sure that if you look closely, you will realize that mouse cells oscillate faster than humans, okay. So in fact, we can we so it, this is faster than this, and we can quantify this. One way that we can do that is we can just, for instance, take one uh, area of the picture, and we can build these chymographs here for both mice and humans. This is this space, and this is time. And as you can see, as time progresses, the cells are oscillating, and uh, clearly you can very clearly see that the oscillations from the human cells are slower. So here we only have five oscillations. Here we have almost ten. Okay, on the other step. Okay, this is the same time scale. So indeed, we know that the somatogenesis clock is slower in humans. So we can quantify the periods and we see that the period in mouse uh, presomitic mesoderm is on the order of 120 minutes and in uh, humans it's, 100, it's 300, 320 minutes, okay? So definitely the somatogenesis clock is slower in humans, which is consistent with, the, with this more slowly uh, development uh, that we see in humans. Now, the question is, where is this time scale difference coming from? Okay, that's one of these other questions that I was telling you. These are very simple questions that we don't know the answer yet. For instance, one possibility could be coming from the gene itself. This HES7 gene is different in humans and mice. Okay, this is, this is just a picture. This is the human genome. Uh, this would be the mouse genome. And here you have the human HES7 gene and the mouse HES7 gene. And in fact, they are different genes. So they have different sequences. And the question would be, okay, maybe this is the sequence. Maybe this is the specific gene that produces this difference in time scales, but that's not the case. So one thing that the, that the Mickey and their collaborators did in what I think are very nice experiments is that they did the following. They take mouse uh, PSM cells, they eliminated this gene, the mouse version of the gene, and they substituted by the human version. Okay, so this, is, this is what we call here rescue. So these are the mouse cells, cells here, and we, we knock them out, we knock the gene out, we eliminate the HES7 gene, the native gene, and we can uh, substitute it by, again, the same copy of the mouse. So this is, just a, uh, this is just a control. And you can see that this is the period, 150 more or less minutes. And what we can see is it doesn't matter. You can use the mouse version of the gene or the human version of the gene, and you get the same 
period, okay? So we are, we, the only thing that we are changing is the sequence of the gene. We are using the human gene in the mouse cells. And the same thing happens if we use the mouse cells in the humans, uh, the mouse gene in the human cells, okay? So this is the human cells. We knock the gene out, the native gene, and we rescue it with it again, the human gene or the, the mouse gene. Here we get, of course, 300 and whatever minutes. And the interesting thing is that here we are using the mouse gene inside the human cells and we get the same period. So this is a clear indication that the difference in period is not due to the difference in the gene. Okay, that's the first point that I wanted to tell you. So now the question is, where do the differences come from? And this here, it's where a mathematical model can help because now we can model all the steps in our loop, in our H7 loop, in particular, for instance, expression and decay, expression and degradation. Okay, so we can measure experimentally using uh, assays that I'm not going to get into the degradation of the H7 molecule or the production of the H7 molecule. And then we can look at the mathematical models and fit data. And then we can obtain the lifetimes of the, for instance, one of the things that we can measure is the lifetime of the protein. So we have a parameter that we can use in our model. And we can also measure the delay in the expression experimentally fitting with these partial models, okay? And we see that the, in both cases for humans, the, the degradation, the lifetime of the protein is larger and the delay in the expression is larger. This is clearly uh, a difference, okay? It's a, a clearly statistically significant. We can also measure the delay in the repression that I was telling you earlier. We use in another assay fitting with our uh, model. And then we can see that in this particular case, our data is consistent with no delay in repression. Okay, so in this particular case, there's no delay in repression. Okay, whereas there is delay in expression. And of course, there's a finite protein lifetime. So what we can do is we can take these parameters that we have measured we, in our model and we can put them together in a full model of the negative feedback loop, okay? And then we can put all the parameters that we have measured, we introduce this in the model, we, mo we, we, we simulate this model and we, we do obtain a clear difference in the period between the human between the human and the mouse. This is the Hill coefficient. It doesn't really matter, but you can see that there is a large variable, a large range of Hill coefficients in which we have the same uh, reasonable difference between human and mouse uh, periods, okay? So what we have learned is that uh, what happens is that what controls the period is the delay, the different delays, the expression delays and the degradation, but not the expression, by the way. So one other thing that we can do, this is an analytical, this is an analytical result from the model that we can solve analytically. And we see that the expression parameters are really not changing the period. What changes the period are the delays and the degradation, okay? And indeed this, we see that this is what happens experimentally. In fact, uh, what the Mickey did later is they, they studied the difference in expression delays and lifetime in other genes, not only H7 in these PSM cells. And we can see that consistently the lifetime of these proteins, of these different proteins, not only has seven, is consistently larger in humans and in mice. The expression delays are also consistently, consistently larger in humans and in mice. And this happens not only in cells from the, from the presomitic mesoderm, it also happens in other cell types. For instance, we can take a look at a completely different cell type, which is neural progenitor cell, and we can take a look at different kinds of genes. And again, we see that consistently the lifetimes are larger and the expression delays are also larger for, mouse, for, for human than for mice, okay? So basically our, uh, from given this combination of modeling and experiments, what we can say is that in this particular case, there are species specific differences between mice and, between mice and human in such a way that what happens is in mice, degradation of the proteins is faster and the delays are shorter with respect to humans. And the, the mystery continues because of course, the, the, the issue is that we don't know why. So the next question is mechanistically, why is this happening? So again, we know that it's not due to the specific sequence of the genes. It is due to some more systemic effect, systemic differences between the two species that explain this difference in time scales that results in a, in a, in a clear difference in the developmental times between the two species. So with that, I think I'm going to finish. This is the summary of the two things that we have been discussing uh, in this talk. First of all, I try to show you that we need cell-cell signaling by FGF. Not only we need it, it's also sufficient for cell-fate decision in the early mouse embryo, and this leads to a robust cell-fate decision. And we ha I have also shown you that the timescale differences between mice and human clocks, developmental clocks, are due to differences in some biochemical parameters, not all of them, right? Not, for instance, the ones associated with gene expression, but the ones associated with genes like with the protein lifetimes and with the expression delays. 
And with that, I'm going to thank uh, my collaborators. So the first part of the talk, the experiments were done by Nestor Saiz in the lab of Hakanji Antonakis at Stone Catering. And the second part was done in the group uh, of Nikki Evisuya at Denver, Barcelona. The project started at Riken, where she was at the beginning. And uh, also in collaboration with the, the groups of Rio Ichiro, Kageyama, and Kantas Aleph at Kyoto University. So with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. And now the floor is open for questions. So uh, you can either write it in the chat or you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and speak up. So if there are any questions. Uh, yes, first question from Jerome. You can go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Hi. Thank you, uh, Jordi, for this very nice lecture. So I'm breaking the ice. <laughs> yes, I have uh, I have a couple of uh, of questions. As first, the, the great strengths of all the models that you have, and these uh, this this probabilistic and, and regulatory network models uh, are all well characterized with uh, with uh, rate constants. And, and and so you, you can capture the time effects, which is uh, which is a great asset. Up to which point then this necessity uh, limits you in terms of uh, model extension and 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 model upscale? You mean uh, the the need of uh, determining all the parameters? Uh, exactly, especially the rate constants. Yes. Well, uh, well, there are two options. Either you measure very carefully all the parameters, which is more or less what we did uh, with uh, with Mickey, or uh, you use the. I mean, for instance, in the case of the, that is why we decided to go to this minimal model in the case of uh, the Gata Six Nanok uh, decision, because honestly, there is very little known at the at the molecular level with in 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 vivo embryos about the values of these parameters and that is why i was so much focused on become making the model as minimal as possible and, and make it dimensionless and just uh, if you remember we have only two dimensionless parameters of course then you can of course look at what is the uh, what is the robustness of the behavior of the model to the values of these parameters and we saw i, I haven't told you this but for instance the the explicit the specific uh, partitioning of the fates in a more or less 50-50 split depended on the parameter K, but not so much on the parameter alpha. So we know by, by looking at the model and by analyzing the sensitivity of the behavior of the model to these parameters, we know what the parame what parameters are going to be uh, more important to determine than others. And hopefully, once we focus on, once we know what are the parameters that are important, then we can try to measure them experimentally. In our experience, there are some parameters. And again, the parameter alpha in the first part of the talk or the expression rates in the second part of the talk that really do not change much the behavior that we're interested in explaining. So uh, this is the so-called sloppy modeling in, 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 this kind of, uh, in this kind of research. So we know that there are some parameters that are sloppy. The biological systems that have some parameters that are sloppy, but it doesn't really matter how, what is the specific value. The, the system is going to behave in the same manner. So the question is, how do you identify the parameters that are sloppy and the parameters that are really they need to be tuned very carefully? And then, of course, the question is, uh, we need to we would need to model those parameters as uh, as as, uh, as precisely as possible. Uh, in my experience, uh, these models, the dynamical models that we have been talking about, are usually quite robust. It doesn't really matter as much to what is the exact value of the parameters. Um, uh, either the parameter doesn't, doesn't matter at all, or if it matters, it's not, we don't have to fine tune it extremely well. So which means that uh, in my opinion, uh, with the values of parameters that are more or less reasonable biologically and consistent with what we know, we have enough to maybe scale up the model if necessary. Mm -hmm. So do you mean that the most critical aspect is uh, the way your uh, ordinary differential equations are coupled, which would be then the topology yes. of yes. the representation that you have? Well, right? yeah, for me, I mean, for me, the key is to, uh, is to identify the, the behavior, a behavior that is not trivial enough. I mean, what I, will, I like to say, it's not so easy to make something oscillate. That's my, that's my point. I mean, it is very easy to make something produce a protein at a certain constant level, but it's not so easy to make something oscillate. So this means that the region in parameter space, if you, for instance, if you want to do parameter inference, this is something that we know. If you want to do parameter inference on a dynamical uh, system such as an oscillator, 
this is uh, the fact that you have oscillations means that the para if you really infer parameters using some kind of maximum likelihood method, if you have some clear well-defined oscillations with, and you know the period and you know the modulation depth, it's really the parameter inference methods are going to give you a good result. This is not going to be the case if you just have a protein being expressed at a constant level because there are millions of ways of expressing a protein at a constant level. That's why I think we take, we make use of the dynamics of this kind of dynamical behavior. We have time scales, we have periods, we have the, we have a, the characteristic time for self, the self aid decision that we can fit. If we have this type of features, then we have quite enough of constraints to really uh, determine or estimate the values of our parameters. That's my point. Okay, thanks. And then my second question uh, is, uh, when you are actually determine uh, exper exper experimentally, uh, experimentally so the relation to the mRNA expression, and so you're using, what, what kind of cells are you using? Are you using cell lines or are you using uh, primary cells? And, and you mean you, you mean the second you mean uh, you mean here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, these are as I was uh, maybe yeah. So what I want so basically what Miki did is uh, in the case of the of mouse, she used uh, mouse embryonic stem cells and induced uh, induced them to become PSM. Okay? okay. So the protocols are very well established. Okay. What are the different uh, factors again signaling factors that transform uh, embryonic stem cells into PSM-like cells? So if you will, it's a cell, it's a cell line that comes from, uh, from stem cells. In the case of humans, we are not using embryonic stem cells. We are using induced pluripotent stem cells, which come from adult cells. But again, it's the same thing. Once you have this, this induced pluripotent stem cells, there is a protocol, well-defined protocol that produces PSM cells. Okay, so you, you, you have a sort of uh, standardization of your experimental system. Yes, yes. Right? Okay, yes, of course, it depends. I mean, uh, it, uh, things are going to depend on the protocol that you are using, uh, but, uh, uh, but well, I mean, once you have fixed your protocol, it can be quite reproducible, yes. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jordi. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Are there any other questions from the public? I just had a quick, maybe just a curiosity, uh, I found, I found this very interesting, this last part in which we have this time periodicity that translates into a special periodicity. Uh -huh. and, and it's based, uh, you said, on a negative uh, feedback delay no? on, of uh -huh. a protein. And I was wondering if this, is, uh, if this is something in common also with other spatially periodic structure in biology or in nature more in general some general mechanism or if it is very specifically to these to this setting I don't uh, know. well i mean uh, i'm not so sure at all i mean whenever you have a a specially periodic pattern uh, i have i mean well in this particular case it is a very natural solution because you have to think and in my opinion it's quite impressive because you yeah, have yeah. A, a you have a, you, you have a tissue that is growing and at the same time you have to establish this kind of periodic uh, this this periodic length scale so it is a very very elegant solution that evolution has found to produce this kind of periodicity. Now, in any other biological system that requires, uh, well, in fact, we we now know this is uh, that we believe that the same thing is happening in bacteria, which is the other field in which I am working. Uh, uh, but the, uh, in any area in which you have a well-defined special periodicity, you are going to have probably this as a solution. In physics, in 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 in, in non-living matter, this is known. There are examples of this type of. Uh, dynamics. Yeah. In biology, this is the well, the best known example that I know of. Uh, now we know that I, in bacteria, this is also happening, I believe. And I think whenever you have, you need this type of a special periodicity in a, in a, for instance, in a growing tissue, this is a, a, a possible solution. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So any, any other questions from the floor? If not, I believe we can we can maybe close. Uh, so we are again on time. And thank you so much to our speaker and also thank to you. everybody that was listening today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jody. Enjoy thank your you. Meeting. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Julia.